Warning, all the words are offensive when you have to talk about the shit we cover on this show. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by Honey, All Birds, and by the new alternative RPG for Catholics who are pretty sure Pikachu is satanic, Pokemon. Pokemon, catechumenate them all. And now, The Scathing Atheist. Hello, all you scathing atheists. Uh, my name is Margot, and I definitely have examples of filthy monkey men. I do believe, yes, we have evolved from them, but many, many, many people that I have encountered in my life have definitely not, and I would invite you to come to my blog and read all about it. www.dontshamethefamily.com Thank you. It's June 16th. And it's Corpus Christi Day. Well, if you, I think if you're an atheist, it's just a cracker. But regardless, <laughs> I'm no illusions. Um, Ethan Wright. And from Henry Ford's Michigan and Martin Luther King Jr.'s Georgia, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, a Christian terrorist realizes too late that burning down hell doesn't even make sense. <laughs> Christians ignore the Norse god of thunder in the Marvel Universe, but have a full <laughs> meltdown about a Muslim girl. Right. And Anna will be here to run up that hill song. But first, the diatribe. So... Either I accidentally walked into a funeral for some dude named Jesus Christ last weekend, or those motherfuckers spent the whole time talking about the wrong guy. I, I guess this was inevitable, right? I'm, I'm in South Georgia, so after last week's diatribe about the passing of my father-in-law, the odds that I was going to spend this diatribe talking about all the religious bullshit in the funeral were one. And, and, and look, when it's a really religious person that dies, it's still tactless, but at least it's understandable, Right. Like, if I die in a mass shooting, I really hope that y'all politicize the hell out of my death. And if you did, it might not be tactful, right? But it would be understandable. You'd have my posthumous permission. So, like, when my wife's uber Christian grandma's service literally included the pastor giving out the address to his church along with basic directions, I tamped down my frustration by reminding myself that as tactless as it was, it's exactly what she would have wanted. Right. She would have wanted any filthy atheist that attended her funeral to be confronted with a bunch of Jesus bullshit the whole time. But my father in law wasn't religious. Yeah, I, I mean, if you pressed him on it, he'd probably tell you that he believed in God. He'd probably even tell you he was a Christian, but only in the sense that that's like the default setting on Americans in the South. Right. The, the number of times I've seen him go to church in the 26 years that I knew him was 12 shy of a dozen. I've never seen him pray. Right. I mean, sometimes when his friends or family would stop by to see him towards the end, they'd ask to pray with him. And, you know, in those cases, he'd play along. He'd listen to their stories about how he was going to get to ride a Harley on streets of gold after he died. But that was about it. Right. Even when it was clear that he was at the very end, he didn't ask for a pastor. He didn't ask Jesus to come into his heart. He didn't spend his time trying to get right with the Lord. And I'd venture to say that he'd have been damn near as bored and pissed off by all the overt religiosity at his funeral that I was. And and it's not like it was a church funeral, even. We had it at the funeral home nearest to his grave, but that didn't stop the funeral director from just assuming that the whole family wanted to join him in an explicitly Christian prayer beforehand. And, I, you know, look, I get that the family asked a pastor to speak at the funeral. So, of course, he's going to open with a prayer. Of course, he's going to pull quotes out of the Bible. Of course, he's going to frame his eulogy around Christian themes and Christian beliefs about death. I can handle that. But it's not like he's finding biblical passages about coping with loss or about the value of a life well lived. Virtually every sentence he said was some form of, luckily, he was a Christian and you get to see him again if you are too. But don't answer yet. Right. And, and and here's the thing. The, the whole time that they're giving their their fucking timeshare pitch, they're also inadvertently demonstrating just how useless their product is. Right. The, the, the whole gist of their message when it wasn't all for the low, low price of seemed to be death doesn't exist. Trust me, pay no attention to the man inside the coffin. 
The whole damn service was filled with, I truly believe that death isn't an end this, and we never have to say goodbye to our loved ones that. And first of all, any sentence that starts with, I truly believe that, can be dropped into the same bucket you use for sentences that start with, trust me. If you truly believe something, you don't generally need to preface your fucking statement with that fact. Hell, even opening with, I believe that, is suspect. Right, but now you're adding how true your belief is? Fuck off. You don't believe that shit. If any of you motherfuckers truly believed we go to paradise when we die, it'd be some dick-ass shit to cry about, wouldn't it? You want the dude to be stuck here in a feeble body that can't breathe without being hooked up to a machine when the alternative is everlasting joy basking in the embrace of Christ and himself? Fuck you, I truly believe. If you follow that through to its logical conclusion, the whole eulogy should just be, I truly believe he's in heaven with Jesus right now, so I don't know what you guys are making such a big deal about. You want to get brunch? But in addition to being bullshit, it's also a terrible way to cope with death. They're telling themselves and each other ever more emphatic lies with the desperate hope of never having to deal with their own mortality or anyone's mortality. In other words, they're actively building barriers to coping. The opening premise of the let's all cope with death speech is there's no such thing as death. What a terrible way to deal with your own grief, but also what a terrible disservice to your loved ones. Rather than deal with what their loss means to you and thereby acknowledge the importance of their existence, you're just going to pretend you you get to see them again in act four. You know, I, I don't think I personally want a funeral, but if there is some kind of memorial or something, I hope people don't insult my memory in the same way. I feel like anybody who speaks at my memorial should have to sign a waiver agreeing that they believe at a minimum that death is for realsies. Because as bad as this world is, the deceased are not in a better place. And to pretend otherwise is to cheapen their memory, to cheapen the importance of their lives. They are nowhere except in your memories of them. They are nowhere but in the echo of their work and their love that they left in this world. And telling yourself that they're hanging out at the blowjob fountain in celestial Disneyland isn't about honoring them. It's a way to push the grief away and avoid coping with it. But to do that is to push them out of your mind, even when that's the only refuge they have left. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight is the Ben to my Jerry's Heath and right Heath. Are you ready to give me s'more? Okay, I love the ice cream they make. I usually like their politics, but I'm still mad about them getting rid of my Heath bar crunch. Mm -hmm. Apparently, my bars aren't certified non-GMO, so now it's toffee bar crunch. Ah, fuck. Well, okay, but like my name didn't have enough wooey bullshit for them is a pretty good reason for your end, though. Oh, you know? yeah. Okay. I, yeah, I see how it's actually positive. <laughs> All right. I'll let it go. It's still delicious. In our lead story tonight, U.S. Representative Lauren Boebert is guilty of attempted murder. Is she? Now, just to be clear, I'm not talking about the existence of her gun-themed restaurant where she has the staff carry loaded firearms while they also carry a bunch of heavy stuff in a crowded environment. But mm -hmm. I could be talking about that. Yeah. I'm also not talking about opening that restaurant for dine-in service during the height of the pandemic in direct violation of COVID safety regulations. But again, I could be. And I'm not talking about the time she made an illegal pop-up location and sold pestilent pork sliders that gave <laughs> 80 people food poisoning. Yeah. But yes, once again, I could be talking about <laughs> yes. that. No, Just so many. I'm talking about a new attempted murder. During a speech at Charis Christian Center in Colorado Springs last week, she told the audience that she prayed for Joe Biden's, quote, days to be few and for someone to replace him. And according to the Supreme Court of the United States, that is officially a sincerely held attempted murder. Yes, it is. Oh, that's true. That's true. I guess the, the difference between this day and any other seems to have been the specificity of that attempted murder more than anything else. But yeah, <laughs> right. So here's the exact words from Lobobes. She said, quote, I want you to know that I pray for our president. Psalm 109.8 says, may his days be few and another take his office. Hallelujah, she said, glory to God, end quote. At which point the audience full of people who 
claim that praying is real started cheering. Now, okay, maybe she didn't mean I prayed for God to murder the president. Ah, it's not clear, but maybe she didn't. But again, maybe not attempted murder of the president is not great as a way of describing something you did. Nope. And either way, we know how many days are left in Biden's term. Exactly. That number only gets smaller if something drastic happens. So at best, she was saying to God, uh, please carry out a coup, but, you know, don't fuck it up this time and let everyone get in trouble. That's what I <laughs> You're not very good at being God. Well, as a, and to be clear, it isn't at best. No. Right. Because Psalms 1099 continues with let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Oh, that's pretty clear on the murder then. I didn't read that. <laughs> like, maybe there's. There's going to be a divorce and he would disown a hunter. Like, but, but there's, there's also a bunch of Stretchy. shit in there about like his labor being spoiled, his prosperity being blotted out, and his children being beggars. Like, okay. like Psalms 109 is the me yelling at a deceptive exit sign of the <laughs> Bible, right? Some crazy shit. Also worth noting, Bobert stole that bit. That shitty bit is actually stolen. Really? In 2016, then Senator David Perdue made the exact same murdery Bible quip, except directed at Barack Obama. Even down to the super clever, misleading premise, setting up the amazing zinger. He said, almost, quote, I think we should pray for the president. Pray for his days to be few. Classic Psalm quote. <laughs> Switcheroo, got him. And he read the exact same Bible quote, Psalm 108.9 or whatever it was. So just to be clear, Lauren Boebert is guilty of sincerely held attempted murder of the president of the United States and guilty of plagiarizing a sincerely held attempted murder of the president of the United States. So, wow, Merrick Garland, I know you're listening. Big fan of the show. If a doctor prays at a hospital, for example, that's malpractice, right? If someone tweets a prayer for stocks to move, that's an SEC violation. If they, God's omniscient. That's insider trading. Do your fucking job. <laughs> Start prosecuting. Yes. Sincerely held crimes. Absolutely. And in Pride Piper news tonight, the student protests at the Seattle Pacific University of Bigotry and Philosophical Anachronism continued through their graduation ceremony last weekend. When faced with the tradition of shaking the university president's hand upon receiving their diplomas, dozens of students chose to avoid touching vile homophobe and SBU's interim president, Pete Mangeras, by instead handing him tiny little pride flags. That's excellent. And and then he had to still like give them their diplomas because they paid for them and then <laughs> publicly not look really pissed off over a visual representation of refracted light. Of colors, yeah. Exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I love that he was definitely scared of the evil magic that might be happening. Like he's looking at that commencement line. Fuck. I touched, touched like a hundred. Uh, yeah. It's a hundred. If I touch a hundred of these little flags, I'm gay. That's official. <laughs> My pastor told me that how many graduates left. I might not make it. I don't know what I'm going to do. So, so yeah, like we haven't actually talked about this on the show, but this is just the latest step in a student protest that's been going on since the private Christian school elected to retain a lifestyle expectation clause in their employment contract that expressly forbids the hiring of LGBTQ people. Horrible. Which is, like, despicably legal, even in as liberal a state as Washington. Is it? Well, so, to be clear, Washington is one of the 21 states that have laws protecting LGBTQ people from discrimination and hiring. Okay. But Jesus, so laws don't oh, count. Oh, great. Yeah, that's how I forgot we were in because America. Because Jesus, yeah. Is this not America? Now, that being said, there's no legal loophole that forces the student body to like it. So a pretty substantial number decided to stage a sit-in at the president's office, which garnered enough media attention to prompt a couple of their board members to resign in protest of that policy. Who are those people? Like, OK, I'm glad they did it. But like they're thinking to themselves, all right, the psychology department teaches that depression might be literal demons. All right. <laughs> Biology teaches that fossils are a Jewish conspiracy. Ah, That's fine. I'll draw the line if the students remind me about the bigotry and hiring that we've had this whole time. It's always been there. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So again, yeah, I'm glad they eventually quit in press, but that's a weird fucking line in the sand they made. Right. Yeah. Now, the sit-in, as near as I can tell, is ongoing. The students have vowed to keep it going through July, and if the Board of Trustees fails to budge on the policy by then, they're threatening to sue them for breach of fiduciary duties, since you know being nationally known as a bigot school isn't in the best interest of the school or its graduates. That's an excellent point. Right? 
I mean, now, so I, I, of course, have no idea if that lawsuit has legs. But the fact that the students keep ratcheting up the pressure is encouraging. And the fact that they found a clever way to get press while also avoiding having to shake the hand of the asshole presiding over this debacle shows that they're really pretty fucking clever, too. Yeah, it seems like an extremely reasonable lawsuit that should have legs. I'm not an expert either, but it seems like it should be. And if the reputation as a bigot school isn't convincing enough for that lawsuit, um. Maybe the stuff about teaching fake reality at a university. Maybe that would also be, be nice, you know, against fiduciary duties. Be nice if that was illegal. Next up in headlines, the new series Ms. Marvel has a main character who's a Muslim person. Anna. What are the guys talking about? It's the newest, the greatest Christian freakout. That's right. A fictional character isn't the right religion and Christians are freaking out. Yep. Not only is the protagonist Kamala Khan a Muslim person, her family is from Pakistan, she's not white, she's not a man, and her sexuality has not been firmly established as very specifically hetero in that show. So, a bunch of the Christian bigots started review bombing the show with bad ratings after joining a Facebook group called Christians Against Ms. Marvel. Jesus. Now, the group on Facebook was very obviously started by a troll who was going for satire. But now thousands of bigots are totally on board. Jesus, given their propensity for falling into this shit head first. At this point, I'm like 63 percent sure that Paul of Tarsus was a Poe, right? <laughs> Just some dude trying to get free food from him okay. by writing letters. That would explain a lot. Right. So according to the Facebook page for Christians Against Ms. Marvel, quote, this might be the biggest slap in the face for conservative Christians to date. Disney has decided that the face of this franchise should not be Carol Danvers, but should instead be a gay Muslim. Carol Danvers is Captain Marvel. It's a different show. No more straight Christian characters from Marvel. Those days are over. Please join us as we let Disney know that we will not be canceled. End quote. So, okay, just based on that alone, you should probably be able to tell this might not be a real campaign. It might be a troll. But just in case it wasn't already clear, at the top of their page on Facebook, it says, Group created by Wade Wilson, which is the name of the Deadpool character. And if you search for the group name on Facebook, you also find Pagans Against Christians Against Ms. Marvel and Christians Against Dinosaurs Against Christians Who Are Against Dinosaurs and Seeds against Catholics against Catholics against seedless watermelons. Those are the <laughs> okay. groups right next to it. I'm not saying those aren't troll groups, but none of them are sillier than that time Jerry Falwell outed Tinky Winky. <laughs> right? Like it's just <laughs> so it's it's it, it, it's not that it's impossible to distinguish the trolls from the reality. It's just that it's pointless. <laughs> <laughs> you make a good point about it being pointless. So, moral of the story. Christian bigotry is beyond satire, and they're proud of it. They're proud of it in this case. They got tricked into freaking out by a troll, and even when it became super obvious, they were like, yeah, but this bigot momentum is pretty solid at this point. I, we're going to roll with it anyway. In response to a troll saying, okay, this is how stupid you are. I'm doing a thing to show you that. They responded, oh, you think we're stupid? We'll show you exactly how stupid we are. And they, <laughs> in your face, we're winning. And meanwhile, the show about the delightful Muslim girl got a whole bunch of attention. So fuck your face. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've only seen the debut episode as of this recording, but it's cute. I'm a little worried that they're going to play the whole like mom wants you to obscure all your shameful lady shaped parts as a like work of culture rather than a misogynistic tradition. But we'll wait and see. Yeah. But while we're on that subject, I guess I should hand things over to my lovely wife, Lucinda. But first, a quick word from this week's first sponsor, Honey. Hey, Heath, what you got? Th is that is that Mitch McConnell's face? Do I need to call uh, Andrew? <laughs> no, I see the confusion. No, no, I'm just doing some online shopping. And this is a giant ball of honey. Okay, okay why? Oh, uh, somebody told me if I put honey on my computer, I can save money. I, I don't think that's what they meant. They, they were probably talking about honey, the plugin for your browser. Oh, what's honey, the plugin for my browser? 
Honey saves you money when you're shopping online. When you're shopping on one of your favorite sites and you go to check out, the Honey button drops down and all you have to do is click apply coupons. Wait a few seconds as Honey checks for the coupons of that site. And if Honey finds a working coupon, you'll watch the prices drop. You can even add Honey to your phone, too. Just enable it on your phone's browser and you can get savings on the go. Oh, that sounds super easy, actually. It is. I actually saved $15 using Honey when I was buying pet supplies for my cats the other day. Okay. I feel like I'm straight up missing out not having honey. Well, if you don't already have honey, you could be straight up missing out. That's correct. All right. It's literally free and installs in a few seconds. And by getting it, you're doing yourself a solid and supporting this podcast. Same goes for anyone listening. I'd never recommend something I don't use. You should definitely check it out. All right. So how do I get it? Get honey for free at joinhoney.com slash scathing. That's joinhoney.com slash scathing. Nice. I'm in. Okay, circling back, why would you have Mm -hmm. like loose... Like a loose ball of honey. Like why not? Why not? Like in a jar. Uh, I don't know, Noah. Uh, why do I have a loose ball of honey? Why do I also have a loose ball of cheese right here next to it? Why is anything anything? You know, I don't just, know, Noah. Just calm down, calm down. I was just curious. Okay, you really want to know what I was going to do with these? Oh, actually, no, no, I don't. Good point. I was going to. Okay. A man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she was. If it's a legitimate rape. It makes you a slut, right? It, cooking can be fun. Hey, I'm proud of a man. This week in misogyny. Man, I've been going for a bit, and it really seems like my arch nemesis, Lori Alexander, has been taking full advantage. I've missed Twitter rants where she's claimed bikinis cause unwanted pregnancies, bemoaned the existence of preschools, and explained the proper way of grooming children. I should never let her have a head start. But I've got far worse to talk about this week. I know I'm a little late to this story, but I can't let this one go by without comment. A couple weeks ago, the Ohio State Legislature passed possibly the most damaging and disgusting anti-trans legislation in the country, which is a really high bar to clear. Not only did they bar trans girls from competing in gender-appropriate sports, but they added a jaw-dropping provision that would force female athletes to undergo an invasive genital inspection if anybody expresses doubts about an athlete's birth certificate's opinion on their gender. And lest I graze over how terrifying this is, I want to draw your attention back to the word invasive there. And look, even if this bill works exactly as they planned it to work, it's disgusting. Hell, one could make an argument that finding new ways to exclude and isolate trans people is homicidal. But even transphobes should be terrified of this law. It says if a participant's sex is disputed, their wording, not mine, by anyone, the athlete must provide a doctor's note confirming their physical sex on the basis of, quote, the participant's internal and external reproductive anatomy, end quote. This dispute could come from a losing student, a bitter parent, a jilted ex-boyfriend. It doesn't matter. So as vicious as the intent is, the execution is somehow even worse. But I'm not only bringing bad news this week. I also have an encouraging story out of, believe it or not, Florida, where, believe it or not, a religious group is doing a good thing in the, believe it or not, abortion debate. Specifically, a Jewish group has filed a lawsuit claiming that the state's 15-week abortion ban, which goes into effect next month, is a violation of the religious freedom, as Judaism requires women to have control of their bodies. According to the lawsuit, quote, in Jewish law, abortion is required, if necessary, to protect the health mental or physical well-being of the woman, or for many other reasons not permitted under the act, end quote. And they're definitely right. Hell, even the part of their scriptures that Christians co-opted, there's at least one instance where the book requires an abortion. It even gives you a magical abortion spell. I should also at least mention the fact that the Southern Baptist Convention made quite a bit of press last week when they debated admitting female pastors. I'm hesitant to call this good news in any meaningful sense, since it's just a debate. No changes have been announced. What's more, they're almost certainly doing it to distract from the devastating child sex abuse report that just came out about them. So it's also cynical as hell. But still, when you're far enough behind the times, pretty much any step is a step forward. So reserved and partial kudos to the SBC, I guess. And quick before hell freezes over, I suppose I should hand things back over to Noah and Heath. Thank you, Lucinda. 
Next up in headlines, and Uncle Sham wants you to news, I learned another <laughs> word that Christians invented to make their transgenerational game of make-believe sound like a bona fide academic subject this week. And if it wasn't for the fact that they called the study of angels angelology. Do they seriously call it Look that? it up. It's true. That's real. <laughs> this would be the silliest one yet. Missiology is apparently the academic what? study of religious missions. Fuck you. And I learned that when I saw a story on OnlySky.media about an army chaplain named William Harrison who earned his PhD in the subject with a thesis on how best to exploit America's military for the purposes of proselytization. Get out of uh, the, the, the suffixology just rolled over in its grave. That's horrible. Yep, right. Now, so to be clear, that's a thing that chaplains aren't allowed to do. No. Right, proselytization, or as Eli would say, proselytization. <laughs> but despite, you know, the rules, his thesis was unambiguously titled The United States Military, A Field for Great Commission Fulfillment. Okay. I feel like we don't need the word missiology. It's reverse oncology. That's what, the, <laughs> that's what that is. That thesis might as well be called How to Spread Religion Like a Fucking Cancer Without Being Detected. Yeah. That's horrible. Yeah. Now, the entire existence of military chaplains is inherently problematic, but officially their job is to provide religious comfort to soldiers regardless of their faith. So they're not there to proselytize. In fact, they can't. No soldier can. According to former Pentagon spokesperson, Lieutenant Commander Nate Christensen, quote, service members can share their faith, evangelize, but must not force unwanted, intrusive attempts to convert others of any faith or no faith to one's belief proselytization end quote okay well yeah no so i'll admit that's kind of a blurry line or the same but you'd think that if anybody would understand it it would be a goddamn army chaplain you'd hope and yet harrison's entire fucking thesis is that soldiers should exploit every opportunity to break that fucking rule okay why can't they just have a rule that says no evangelizing during army stuff there you go can we not have moments when that's not allowed sometimes like, I don't know, if a doctor cuts you open for surgery and then they're like, hey, do you have a moment to talk about our Lord and Savior, <laughs> Jesus Christ? That needs to be illegal. I hope it already is. If they said at that same moment, that same doctor, if they were like, hey, do you have a moment to talk about today's wordle? I was trying to figure out how to get tea and also illegal. Why is this so complicated? It's because of fucking Christian privilege. So, OK, so here it is straight from the fucking dissertation. Quote. Active duty army chaplains are woven into the fabric of the military culture and have direct access to soldiers and their families. Therefore, this strategic position for gospel ministry should be fully leveraged by the Southern Baptist Convention and its local churches through intentional education, training and other support to disciple America's military families, end quote. <sighs> yeah, he also advocates for the SBC to set up faith based counseling centers that accept the military's TRICARE insurance plan so they can target veterans with, quote, again, quote, mental health issues such as PTSD, moral injury, suicide ideation, and intervention for marriage or family crises, end quote. So to be clear, he's advocating for tricking soldiers with mental health problems into getting a Christian timeshare pitch instead <laughs> of qualified counseling. It's despicable. On the taxpayer's dime. Yeah, stealing money from the government. Yeah. Now, Harrison is retired, so it's not like the military could take any disciplinary action against him for advocating all this bullshit. But they also could, like, at least offer up a full-throated condemnation of his tactics. Have they? Needless to say, of course, they won't. No, no, of course not. All right. Next up in headlines in Iron Chariots of Fire News. Mm -hmm. A rabid fan of the Boston Red Sox and the Christian god of the universe named Daniel Lucy tried to burn down the headquarters of the Satanic Temple in Salem, Massachusetts last week. But, as we all know, God of the Universe is a Yankees fan, so unfortunately for the Boston man, the arson did not work out at all. Lucy started the fire on the porch of the building and then just walked away, at which point somebody came outside from the building and put it out pretty much immediately. And then I'm assuming that person cackled into the distance. Your puny God is no match for a demonic elixir of hydrogen hydroxide. <laughs> we derive our power from the depths of hell. Ah! No, no, I'm just kidding. We don't, we don't believe any of that. You guys are dumb. Stop doing hate crimes. Seriously, stop. 
Silly Christian terrorist. Everybody knows you have to attack satanic temples with ice weapons. <laughs> fucking, fucking noob. Obvi. So here's how we already know the identity of the hate criminal and why he's already been arrested. First of all, he walked onto the porch and stared directly into a camera yep. and then started pouring lighter fluid and lit a fire. Also, he was still there when the police showed up. Was he? Yeah. Apparently, he lit the fire, walked away for a few minutes, but then he pretty much immediately came back to see how his amazing, godly fire was going. Well, it was not going. And the cops were there, and they were like, hey, you're... Wow. You're you're obviously the guy who stared into the camera <laughs> and then started the fire that we just watched that video of. And you're still wearing the same T-shirt that just says... God in block letters <laughs> yes. on the front, man. Come, you're under arrest. You're so dumb. <laughs> like, okay, like for realsies, if he'd gone with Groucho glasses, that would have been an improvement. <laughs> it would have been a step in the right direction. <laughs> it would have taken him a second or two more. Yeah, yep. probably. And just to be clear, I wasn't just guessing about this being a hate crime by a fanatical Christian. Now, okay, I was guessing about him being a Red Sox fan, but all right, let's be honest. Irish guy from Boston who sets fire to a satanic temple. That's a fucking lock. He's a Red Sox fan. <laughs> but the hate crime is for certain. When Lucy came back to the scene, he still had his backpack on, which had, they found, two quarts of lighter fluid inside, a bunch of extra sticks that he gathered and never used what? to make his fire, and a copy of the Constitution of the United States. You, that's so like you add a picture of a Chinese guy. It's a Marky Mark starter kit in his backpack. <laughs> and one other clue that this was a hate crime. When he got arrested, Lucy told the cops, "Quote: This is a hate crime." Oh, exact words. Oh, interesting. Well, hey, the great job, Christian terrorist guy. Because if there's one thing the Satanic Temple hates, it's free publicity. <laughs> you know, those poor guys had to deal with press attention from NBC, CBS, U.S. News and World Report, the Boston Globe. It must have just been a fucking nightmare for them all day. Yeah. Well, speaking of which, the day after the fire, they got all the attention. But Satanic Temple spokesman Lucian Graves, he still had to give yet another angry deadpan explanation to the public about what they do at this temple approximate quote i'm paraphrasing but it's really close he's like okay for the 975th time we don't actually worship a literal demon that's dumb satan is a metaphor that symbolizes the rejection of tyranny for us and our building isn't magical right we just have like desks and stuff man <laughs> stop doing hate crimes <laughs> fuck and finally tonight in willing and maple news as if to say, don't forget to remind your listeners how much better our country is than yours, the Canadian Armed Forces officially endorsed their first humanist chaplain on Tuesday, nice work. putting them ahead of America's armed forces by infinity percent. Yeah, Mary Claire Kadij was approved by the Canadian Armed Forces back in May, but the service made it official this week. And as it happens, the new part isn't the chaplaincy so much as the humanism. Uh, apparently, she was serving as a Catholic chaplain since 2017, but shed her Catholicism over the last few years. I can't imagine what major Canadian news story about the nation's history with Catholicism <laughs> might have prompted a person to rethink their professional endorsement of it. But, you know, regardless, uh, she isn't Catholic anymore. So there's finally someone in the Royal Canadian Chaplain Services that represents the 32 percent of that country that is non-religious. Yeah. And now she represents the. 100% of the military who might need counseling about real reality. Yeah. Okay, churches, did you guys hear it? Do you see what happened? Addition by subtraction of something stupid. <laughs> that stupid thing was you. Yeah. Your religion. Now, there are a few logistical hurdles, apparently. Unlike organized religions, there's no institution with the ability to accredit humanist chaplains. So according to the CAF's Interfaith Committee on Canadian Military Chaplaincy, they reached out to Humanist Canada to enable and facilitate the change. Not exactly sure what facilitation was required. Like, <laughs> if they have to bring in a humanist to change all her Jesus flesh back into crackers or <laughs> unrub her rosaries or whatever. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, I don't know. But Humanist Canada is apparently establishing its own form of accreditation to make this easier in the future. 
should any other humanists decide to follow Captain Khadijah's lead. And, and just a reminder that when a fully qualified dude in the U.S. Navy with a recommendation from the Navy Chaplain Appointment and Retention Eligibility Advisory Board applied for the same honor in the U.S. military, like back in 2014 and again in 2018, congressional Republicans blocked the appointment both fucking times. <sighs> and... With like as though the people in the hundred and five degree heat needed yet another reason to move to Canada. We've given you one, so we'll close there. <laughs> Heath, thanks as always. Oh Canada. <laughs> and when we come back, uh, Anna will be here to break down a song that's as close to just saying Jesus, Jesus, Jesus for four minutes as anything we've ever reviewed. <laughs> Hey, what you got there? Oh, is that Pat Robertson's face? Should I call Andrew? Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. This is happening again. I, I see the confusion. No, uh, I'm just getting ready for a run. And this is a big ball of spackle. Okay, but why? I'm spackling my, my old shoes. I I should have seen that coming. Yeah. But I, I feel like you should probably just get a new pair. Why don't you try the tree flyer from Allbirds? Oh, what's the tree flyer from Allbirds? Hold on. Are they a fey demon with a fire sword? What? Why would they learn it the hard way? No, no, they're, they're they're a great new lightweight running shoe. Oh, all right, sounds good. But are they comfortable? Do they have good cushioning, like my trusty pair right here? Well, they have excellent cushioning, so they're super comfortable, even if you're going long distance. Oh, I, I didn't know you were into long distance. Well, I, you know, there are a few road signs that I really hate, and I uh -huh. like to insult them in person every insult so often. Insult them in person, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. They're a bit of a track, but my my tree flyers are perfect. Okay, but are they good for the environment? Great question. They're not just light in weight, but they're also light in terms of their carbon footprint. They're made with eucalyptus fiber and super breathable, which is important when it's 105 degrees in South Georgia for like six months at a time. Yeah, that happens. All right, I'm in. Where do I get a pair? Lace up the tree flyer and get running today at allbirds.com. That's A-L-L-B-I-R-D-S dot com. Allbirds.com. Got it. Sounds good. Okay, so now I'm curious. Are those... The original Reebok pumps from 1989? From 1989, yes, they are. Good eye. It's important to maintain the structural integrity of the inflation mechanism using the spackle. So, um, you want to borrow the ball of spackle when I'm done? No. You can f*** if you want. Then yes, actually, okay. Road signs? Yeah, yeah, road signs. Got it. In a lot of ways, our job is just a thinly disguised excuse for masochism. Whether it's reading the Book of Mormon, following Christian blogs, or watching virtually every movie in Kurt Cameron's filmography over on our sister show, we never pass up on an excuse to abuse ourselves for your enjoyment. And who knows more about voluntary masochism than the person who intentionally married Eli? And that's why we're excited <laughs> to welcome back Anna Bosnick for this week's installment of God Awful Music. And a blink if you're being kidnapped. <laughs> so, first of all, Anna, welcome back. Always a pleasure. Oh, Noah, I am actually bouncing up and down in my seat right now. I am so excited for <laughs> this tune. As am I. <laughs> and you know what? I, so I should also reintroduce the already accounted for Heath Enright, since it'll make Eli jealous when he hears this. <laughs> so, Heath, welcome, welcome to still being here. All right. Thanks for blowing up my spot. Now everybody knows that I have to review this fucking song. All right. <laughs> Whatever. I could have just been silent. <laughs> so tell us, Anna, what are we going to be breaking down today? We will be breaking down a beautiful name. Words and music by Ben Fielding and Brooke Ligertwood. Ligertwood. Sorry, what's the name? <laughs> Brooke Ligertwood? Yikes. Anyway, so <laughs> it's fucking hard to find a single musician credited to this song because the Hill song we're talking about. The, what should I call it? The cult that we're talking about. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> they do not want any, want to credit any musicians. This is only credited to God <laughs> as far as they're concerned. Oh, yeah, right. So, okay. And Heath, how bad was this music? Well, if you love Sarah McLaughlin, but you always wondered why she didn't cut an album during the middle of a stroke she was having, <laughs> you <laughs> will love this song. Yeah. So, okay. We rely on Anna's expertise and masochism, of course, for these <laughs> selections. So, Anna, why did you pick this song for us? 
Because it's about damn time we did Hillsong. Right? I've mentioned, okay, so I've mentioned that I love listening to this shit for fun. I, I think it's like similar to how people get really into serial killers or like true crime or whatever. <laughs> anyway, I know people who used to go to Hillsong as congregants in NYC <sighs> and have since obviously quit and discussed. Yeah, right. But they are incidentally all amazing singers. Huh. And this is not going to be a roast of musicianship. No, no. Hillsong is great at roping in talented musicians. In fact, I would hazard to say that Hillsong has done the best at actually emulating what's going on in the mainstream of music. So the stuff from the 90s all sounds like Celine Dion, Lauren Hill, that kind of stuff. The 2000s, Christina Aguilera, boy bands, Coldplay. And now we're thoroughly into like Taylor Swift, Ed Sheeran territory. And obviously, like, Aurora and stuff like you're hearing right now. Are we saying all that was bad or good about those eras? I'm saying that they emulated it really okay. well. Oh, right. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah that they fit, that they feigned pop music. No yeah. judgment They feigned the pop music, exactly. So if you like that stuff, they actually got pretty good pop musicians and things like that. So, I liked some of the, a bunch of the stuff you just did. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. I was being defensive, sorry. I, exactly. No, I'm saying that I'm not going to, I'm not bashing the musicianship here, but for as good as the singers are... Their lyrics, I mean, suck, you know, <laughs> sure do. I, yeah. they're the masters. They're a master course in musical manipulation. But they got to get people having orgasmic religious experiences to blah, blah, Jesus, blah, 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 over and over and again, <laughs> yeah, you know, that's their thing. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, I, I'm very excited. So, OK, so but now, of course, for those of you not familiar, music is like one of the main things that Hillsong does on top of covering up sexual assault and abusing their employees. If you're only familiar <laughs> yep. with them from that, they also do music. Yeah, they were like, guys, what if we hire some serious talent to do the jingly keys? Because they need to be fucking jingly. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, right. like, jing, jing, virtuosic jing, 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 jingling of keys is necessary, <laughs> given what we've done. They just have a whole bells chorus going on. <laughs> All right, so without further ado, let's hop into What a Beautiful Name. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, so we start, before the lyrics even happen, we start with some intro noise. Mm -hmm. It's it's not clear what's happening. It's actually confusing what's happening. It sounds like a movie cop is realizing he's about to get ambushed by somebody. That's what the noise is. But then, <laughs> it's okay, right. strokey Sarah McLaughlin starts singing, and it makes no sense. They don't line up at all. <laughs> it's kind of funny that you said the cop thing because the cello actually does the gugunk thing from the beginning of Law and Order. Oh, really? In the background, listen back, you can hear it. <laughs> gugunk. Amazing. Nice. Amazing. Okay, so then. Then the lyrics cut in, mm -hmm. starting with, you were the word at the beginning. Oh, you were the word at the, that's a sentence in English. Okay. Mm -hmm. I heard, Ua, du, uh, to da, bagite. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, th there were, there were <laughs> subtitles, right? Like that's the there only had way. To be subtitle. Yeah. I did challenge you guys to, um, Listen to it without looking at the lyrics first, just because yeah. you can't hear what the fuck she's saying. No, you get ua dua to da bagide. She goes on to say, one with God, the Lord most high. And I'm like, damn it, she's doing that thing like where they weren't sure if they were going to auto tune it. So she just kept her options open, monotone singing. I just, I fucking, I hate this <laughs> genre of music. Anyway, so she goes on, your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you, our Christ. So I legit thought that this song was done in another language until I heard you are Christ. Like the reverb was insane <laughs> yes. in this song. Everything sounded to me like it was some sort of like, it was written in hut. So like, <laughs> Yabba -deeba -da. Yabba -deeba, Luke Skywalker. <laughs> right, all of a sudden, I know where some English. It sounded like a bilingual person talking in, yeah, like Huttese, like a made up language. And then throwing in a quick phrase in perfect English, like exactly. you know, a bilingual person <laughs> might do. It was like, "Twas brillig ye sly the toes, your hidden glory in creation. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I didn't know it. All right, so then we get our first chorus. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. This better be good, right? Yeah, right? Yeah, she's building it up. <laughs> yeah. The name of Jesus Christ, my king. Eh, a bit of a letdown. Okay. okay, so you tell me, Anna, you know singing. <laughs> is she just not that into this song or I, you know i think the lyrics were just boring to her because okay. i think about it Fair. she has to like how many songs does she gotta sing about this dingbat 
Like, <laughs> it's got to get old. It's fair. Yeah. She sounds like her mom made her sing this as a chore when she was 12. Right. Yeah. Like, that's, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Sing. Okay. So they, she goes on. What a beautiful name it is. We haven't heard that enough. So what a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. I mean, there's prettier names. This yes. Cordelia for the Ariel. Sure. Amanita Muscaria. There you go. <laughs> the mushroom? Like, yeah, the mushroom. I mean, it's a beautiful name. Silky Nutmeg Ganache. Just so many oh, better names. There you yeah. go. There you go. Right? Bob the Drag Queen. <laughs> and she finishes up the chorus. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. And I'm like, okay, I don't want to be a pedant here, but like, that's a bastardized form of Yeshua or Joshua. Like you, you guys <laughs> fucked up the translation. And even when you figured it out, you didn't change it to the right name. <laughs> right. So clearly you guys are not as fond of this dude's name as you're letting on. Anyway, <laughs> verse two, she says, you didn't want heaven without us. And by the way, she crammed the word heaven into that meter with a crowbar. <laughs> okay. Yes, yeah. she did. It clearly doesn't fit. She had to say heaven like, Adam Sandler doing Cajun Man, like, yeah, bon. right, right. right. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Jesus, you brought heaven down. That's a fucking sinister lyric, right? <laughs> I'm glad I didn't catch that the first time. Holy shit. Yeah. And doesn't it kind of ruin the victory for the people who make it into heaven when you tell us that? Yeah. Like, yeah. Apparently, Jesus put up like, <laughs> gutter guards to fix the Jewish bowling alley that was way too hard. It just kind of ruins it. Amen. She continues, my sin was great. Your love was greater. What could separate us now? Death, I guess. <laughs> I don't know what could separate you from the non-existence. Yeah, right. Confusing. It's... <laughs> <laughs> well, also, like, I mean, even according to them, blaspheming against the Holy Spirit comes to mind, right? Yeah, sure. sure. Looking yeah. at a sure. woman with lust in your heart and not <laughs> apologizing later. Yeah, sure. Clothing without fringes at the right times or something. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Shrimp, shrimp scampi. Yeah. Shrimp. Oh, absolutely. That'll there do you. it. <laughs> Polyester. Okay. So time for chorus two. What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name. You see what they did there was not yeah, beautiful. Oh, so they moved on yeah. to wonderful. Very clever. A lot of words end in full. It's true. The name of Jesus Christ, <laughs> my king. And so I should point out like musically here. And again, I just I don't like this genre of music that they're using here. But like every line plays like it's right before the drum rolls. It's just going to get the song going. Yeah, you know? it's, it's just it's like it's the <laughs> musical equivalent of giving up mid wank. <laughs> Yeah, the drums were kind of edging. Right, yes, like. yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Musical manipulation. Right. For getting people okay. getting people to the, almost the musical orgasm. So Yeah, but Oh not. God, that's Christianity. It is. The whole thing is just edging and Jesus never comes back. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Nailed it. All right. So she carries on with the lyrics uh, in the chorus here. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. Uh Hecuba, Cher. I knew a lady named Sweet Home Teacup growing up. <laughs> no. Do you? Yeah. This shows a staggering lack of imagination right. on their part. It's all I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. Courtney Act, Alaska Thunderfuck. They, there's so many. Just go straight there's to so drag many. queens. Yep. Straight to RuPaul's. Bob Rams. the Drag Queen, like Anna said before. There you go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Wonderful name. And then she wraps up the course. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And at this point, the band and the singer are in a fight like during <laughs> the music with each other. The band was pretty sure they were playing a shopping montage from an 80s movie. <laughs> but the singer was still getting you to sponsor a hungry child. So yes, yes. nothing lines up. The percussion sounded like my son dumping out his toy box. <laughs> <laughs> Just. <laughs> All right. But the lyrics are about to get worse somehow because it's time for the bridge. I know. Which starts death could not hold you. This is such a confusing part of Christianity. Like, y'all know he died again, like, three days later, right? <laughs> That's true. Yeah, and, and now it's been holding him, the death has been holding him for over 2,000 years. It's a pretty strong hold. Yeah, yeah. choke hold. That's a dumb line. <laughs> yeah, but, okay, and then she follows up, death could not hold you with the veil tore before you, and I'm like, come on, guys, every word rhymes with itself, okay? <laughs> this is just, I mean, it, it's, it's you. <laughs> you, that's like the most rhymable phoneme in the English goddamn language. <laughs> Boogaloo. <laughs> okay, now you're singing about a yew tree. No, that's not even a, you didn't make it right. No, don't do that. 
And then we get this gem of a line. You silence the boast of sin and grave. What does boasting about sin and death look like? Right? Oh, man, my mom never lets me drink myself to death. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Ooh, look who has two thumbs and cancer of the lungs. <laughs> <laughs> Reading my dad's journal. <laughs> Oh, I can't today. I can't hang out today. I'm actually planning a murder suicide later with someone else. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm using ivermectin. There you, it's, it's, it's <laughs> there you go. There you go. Actually, yeah, nailed it. <laughs> oh, there's more. The heavens are roaring. The praise of your glory, which <laughs> like the place you created, spends a lot of time talking about how awesome you are, is not the compliment to God that they seem to think <laughs> that it is. <laughs> yeah, this song is a Tinder profile. It says, "My mom says I'm handsome." <laughs> <laughs> rough she says for, for you are raised to life again how many times are they supposed to wake this guy up right <laughs> I feel like Jesus, Jesus should get to press the snooze button a few more times <laughs> that'd be nice <laughs> I like that idea. Just 2,000 years of Jesus being like, Alexa, Alexa five more minutes. Just set alarm for five more minutes. Like, also, order me a, a mouth sword on Amazon. Gonna need one get, get, yeah, he's going to need one of those. So, and then, okay, and then she says, you have no rival. And I'm like, he, he very literally has a fucking rival. Like The guy's yeah. name, his official title is the anti-him. He very <laughs> obviously has a rival. Yeah, man, he's in charge of the UN. It's in New York. Maybe you heard of it. Right? And your rival is winning so hard right now, and you're hitting yeah. the fucking snooze button, man. Just your whole, all your people are edging and hating it. <laughs> she says, "You have no equal now and forever. God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Jesus, blah blah. Jesus. Yours is the name <laughs> above all names. Are we ranking the names now? Right. I mean, because I know it's not." They're not talking alphabetically. No. <laughs> so Allah definitely comes before him in the deific yellow pages. You gotta there get you go. all the way to the end for <laughs> Yahweh. Ah, uh, God. We changed it. It's uh, <laughs> God. So chorus three starts. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name. It's beautiful, wonderful. Now it's powerful. The name mm -hmm. of Jesus Christ, my king. Bethesda, Cthulhu, <laughs> Captain Marvel, Hoobastank. <laughs> <laughs> um, Blaze, Nitro, Zap. Turbo, any of the American gladiators. There you go. Or the, the Ninja Turtles. Turtles. Oh, that and would Ninja work. Ninja Turtle. Yeah. There you go. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is. And like any Icelandic place name, right? Sure. <laughs> the name of Jesus. Yeah, I named my pug Madge, and I feel like she could stand up to Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so she's pretty badass. Watch out yeah. for that little white patch, right? There you go. So, but then it, it fades out with her saying, what a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. But... I have to write a song about Madge fighting Jesus now. I'm oh, sorry. Fuck, That's yes. uh, yeah, you also have to make a serious major motion picture about Madge fighting Jesus. <laughs> Absolutely. There's a, you know what? Billionaire money. I'm calling it now. This is my first call for billionaire money. This go. has to happen now. All right. I think <laughs> we should start making it low budget and see what happens. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> I feel like this song could finance the movie. We'll find out. Absolutely. <laughs> now Love that song. As I'm sure you guys all know, it's not just about tearing things down here on The Scathing Atheist. It's also about building them back up. So Anna fixed it. And may I just say on her behalf, you're welcome, Hillsong. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Do this for you and your piece of shit musicianship. <laughs> awesome.
Before we cue the music tonight, I want to remind you one last time that I'm giving a talk at the Gulf Coast Secular Assembly in Defuniac Springs, Florida on Saturday the 25th. Check the show notes for links to find more information. Also, if you're suffering from Eli withdrawal while he's off, don't forget to check him out on the new podcast, Dear Old Dads. That'll be linked on the show notes as well. Anyway, that's all the blessing we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be able to look out for a brand new episode of our sister show, The Skeptocrat, debuting at 7 Eastern on Monday. An even newer episode of our half-sister show, God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 Eastern on Tuesday. And an even newer episode of our half-sister show, Citation Needed, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I can't claim the title of host again next week if I neglect to thank Heath Enright for always writing the ship. I also want to thank Eli Bosnick, even though he's not here. He's always here in spirit, which isn't a real thing. Language is complicated. It's even more complicated when you're an atheist. Anyway, I, I also want to thank the lovely and talented Lucinda Illusions for making her triumphant return this week. I need to thank the amazing Anna Bosnick one more time for helping out while Eli was away and for writing downright Yankovician lyrics this week. Amazing job. I also want to thank Margo for providing this week's Farnsworth quote. I want to encourage you to check out her blog at don'tshamethefamily.com, which you'll also find linked on the show notes. It's going to be a busy show notes this week. There's also going to be links to more of Anna's stuff, too. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's and last week's best people. Sarah Montana, Scott Liberal Atheist 2, and Cookie Shape Like Montana, Cassidy, Needle Boykin, John, Kevin, London, Bad Shepherd Pod, Syabra, Whalen, Jabak, Choi, Advises, More Drugs, More Bikes, Cameron, Robert, Stephen, Chris, James, Z, Boom and Shadow, Jerry, Matt, Rick, Eli's Baby, Maybe Subscribe, Byron, Kat, Matthew, Christopher, Diana, Dan, and Jordan's Long Lost Brand, Dan, Alex, Rick, Heather, Daniel, Bovels are Awesome, Elmar, and Andrew, who are so hot meteorologists have to take them into account when they calculate the heat index. Together, these 35 thoroughly thorough thinkers thought they'd thank us for our thumbs down to theism this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the money it takes to give us money, but if you do, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash getting atheist, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad free version of every episode, or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, but money, am I right? You can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review, telling a friend about the show, or following at PIATPod on Twitter. The legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robson handles our social media and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who also wrote the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. Because you could put it on the road sign and kind of fuck it. Well, yeah, no, exactly. It's harder to fuck a road sign before you put spackle on. No, you ball. really do have to have some. You got to have a ball of spackle on. I've you always have said. Something. I've always said that. <laughs> you got to put a big ball of spackle on the road sign before you fuck it. My dad taught me that. Yeah. <laughs> Just dying words.
The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2022. All rights reserved.